So today, I want to talk about our sleep system and our shelter system. Basically, our tent and our sleeping bag and the other bits of equipment that support those two items. I want to talk also about the methods of heat loss. I want to talk about how we get cold, why we get cold, and how to use this equipment to prevent you from getting cold. And then I want to wrap up with some tips and tricks for taking the equipment you already have and making it work in a winter camping environment so that you don't have to necessarily go out and buy new equipment. We concern ourselves basically with four different types of heat loss. Conduction, radiation, convection, and evaporation. Conduction is the easiest one to understand because any t if you've ever sat on a cold rock or on the cold concrete or sat on the snow or sat or laid down on the ice, you've experienced heat loss through conduction. That's just a cold object sucking the heat out of a warm object through direct contact. The next one is radiation. I'm sitting here right now radiating body heat out into the atmosphere. The air right now is colder than my body, so again, it's kind of like conduction, but it's through the air, not through a solid object. Convection works in conjunction with radiation. Basically, my body will radiate heat out into the atmosphere, and then wind or air movement or water movement is going to carry that heat away from me. If you ever heard of wind chill, you're talking about heat loss through convection or convective heat loss. And the last one is evaporation. This is your body's cooling mechanism. When you sweat, you're, you sweat because your body is trying to evaporatively cool you. And so that water comes out onto your skin. As it evaporates, it carries heat away with it. So these are the four things that cause us to lose heat. About it. So as our body is going to radiate heat, and if our body keeps radiating heat out into the cold air, we'll eventually get cold. So what we need to do is to trap that heat in something. And that's what a sleeping bag actually does. It's an insulated bag that you climb into, and it's full of a fill material with a lot of trapped air. And so the heat from your body will escape and will heat the air in that insulation. Hold it next to your body and keep you warm. Sleeping bags are sold with different temperature ratings. The idea behind a temperature rating is it gives you an idea of how cold of an environment you can sleep in in that sleeping bag and still stay warm. This one, for example, says it is a zero degree Fahrenheit rated bag. So in theory, when this bag was new, I could sleep in temperatures that get down to zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is 32 degrees below freezing. As you go with a lower and lower temperature rating, usually the bag is going to get heavier, bulkier, and also more expensive. Look for a mummy style bag. A mummy style bag is going to be tapered at the bottom by your feet. It's fairly small, fairly snug, not a lot of extra space because again it's less airspace for you to heat, so it'll be very efficient. Another key feature of a, of a mummy bag is going to be this hood that you're going to actually have your head in, and the only part of you that's going to be exposed through this hole is your face so that you can breathe. Full-length zipper down the side. A lot of these mummy bags will have another zipper down here at the foot end, so you can open it from the bottom to let some extra heat out if it gets too hot. If you're going to buy your first sleeping bag, your first mummy style bag, I would recommend buying a synthetic fill sleeping bag in the 15 to 20 degree temperature rating. Another item you might want to invest in to enhance your sleep system is a sleeping bag liner. The idea behind this is that it's it acts as a barrier between you and the inside of your sleeping bag because sleeping bags can be hard to wash and so rather than all the sweat and sunscreen and bug repellent and dirt that's on your body from the day rather than that going into your sleeping bag that's very difficult to wash 
all that stuff goes into this instead. When you come home, this is a lot easier to wash. It will significantly increase the life of your sleeping bag. In case you don't have a mummy bag with a very low temperature rating and you're coming to the event with a, a sleeping bag that is not optimal for these conditions, there are a few things that you can do to boost the temperature rating of that bag and to help yourself stay a little warmer during the night. Uh, the first and most obvious thing is uh, if your sleeping bag doesn't have a hood built into it, then you're going to want to bring something to wear on your head to trap a little bit more of that heat and prevent that heat from getting lost. This will make a big, big difference. This might be the difference between being cold and not being cold. Another thing that you can do to improve the temperature rating of a summer weight bag is to buy a sleeping bag liner, a heavier sleeping bag liner. This one's not just designed to, to extend the life of your bag, but this is actually a thicker fleece material. This is like a fleece blanket. This was designed to, to, to go inside of a sleeping bag and increase the amount of insulation, increase the amount of loft, and give you a few extra degrees of, uh, of temperature rating. As a last resort, to keep a suboptimal bag warm, uh, you can resort to things like uh, space blankets. Putting a space blanket uh, on top of your sleeping pad underneath your sleeping bag so that it'll reflect a little extra heat back at your body, or even wrapping your, putting one of these uh, around yourself inside your sleeping bag if you get really, really cold. If worse comes to worse, a couple of these $1 space blankets can actually help. If you're gonna if you're gonna bring one of these before you trust your night's sleep to it, buy a couple extra, take them apart, figure out how they how they work and, and how they might work. They're also very fragile. They're designed to only be used once, so you might only get one night of sleep out of this. If you toss and turn, you're, you're gonna tear that thing to shreds. So if this is gonna be part of your plan, do some research, do some practice, buy more of these little things than you think you're gonna need. Again, this is not my recommendation for what to do, but if you have no other choice this might get you through. There are companies that make slightly more durable uh, versions of these. This is a more durable um, bivy sack style space blanket. It has the same concept. It, it's, it's a very lightweight uh, reflective material that reflects that radiated body heat back towards you. Uh, the nice thing about these, they're a little more expensive, but they are uh, reusable for a couple of nights. The other thing about using these reflective blankets is we talked about evaporative cooling. If you get warm enough, you will sweat and you'll be warm because your heat is being reflected back at you, but you will wake up soaking wet from all of your condensation and sweat. So if you've never tried to spend the night in one of these before, that is something you should be mindful of. Again, this is not my, my recommendation, but this is kind of last resort advice if this is, if this is all you have. You, it can be made to work, but we would much rather see you borrow or find a way to get access to a proper uh, sleep system. To fight heat loss through conduction, we need to place an insulating object between our body and the cold ground and snow that we're going to be sleeping on. So you're need, gonna need some kind of pad or mattress you basically have a choice between a foam pad or some kind of inflatable pad. The most commonly used are the closed cell foam pads. You can find these in surplus stores, you can find these in outdoor stores, big box stores. Brand new, you can find them for $20, $25 used. You can find them for maybe five or $10. If you want to step up a little bit, you can find an air-filled mattress that uses open cell foam as an insulator. They're a little more expensive, they're a little heavier, but they're a lot more comfortable. They're a little thicker, they keep you a little higher off the ground. Let's talk about convection. Let's talk about adding, trapping even more heat by preventing the wind from carrying away what heat does escape the rest of our sleep system. I'm talking about your actual tent. In the snow, you're going to want to have a tent that has a few additional features. You're going to want a tent with a rain fly 
like this, the blue part on this tent is the rain fly. A rain fly that goes all the way to the ground. You want a nice double wall tent that'll trap a little more heat. This tent also has this piece in the front called a vestibule, which gives you a little bit of area to store some of your equipment, your wet gear, outside the actual tent, but still underneath the rain fly. That keeps you from tracking extra moisture inside the tent, but it keeps some of your gear out of the elements, keeps it from getting wet or frozen. Another thing you're gonna wanna look for in your tent is some kind of a, a, a footprint. Uh, and that, that's another piece of material, waterproof material, that goes between the ground and the floor of your tent. Especially if you have an older tent where the floor might not be waterproof anymore, you wanna have a, a tarp or a piece of nylon that will lay on the snow between your tent and the actual snow. That's just one more layer of protection so that you don't get water and moisture seeping up into the tent. Uh, the last thing you're gonna want for your tent is a set of stakes. All tents, all decent tents are sold with stakes, but I see a lot of scouts not using them on most campouts. Your tent will be more spacious, it'll be more comfortable, it'll stand up to wind and snow a lot better if you actually use the stakes that are provided with your tent. With a tent, you wanna basically bring only what you need. So bring a two-person or a three-person tent. Try not to bring these four, five, six, seven, eight-person monstrosities. Number one, they're usually really tall. They're not very stable in the wind. They don't usually have a good rain fly. And usually if only one or two people are spending the night in there, that's a lot of space to heat. You're not gonna be as warm. So I'd recommend bringing a smaller tent, two, three person size, and maxing out the capacity. Having it, having it, if it's a two person tent, put two people in there. If it's a three person tent, put three people in there. You're gonna stay a lot warmer that way. Another thing is to only use your tent for sleeping and for changing clothes. You're not hanging out in there during the day, playing cards, playing on your phone, hanging out, talking with your friends. The more times you're going in and out of that tent, the more time you're bringing your wet, cold boots and pants and gear inside that tent, and you're taking all that nice dry stuff in here that's supposed to keep you warm, and you're making it wetter and wetter and wetter throughout the day. So when I come in the tent, usually it's, it's nighttime, my tent's been set up, my gear is set up, it's ready for me to just jump in the tent and sleep. So I open my vestibule, I open my main door, I usually I get into the tent, I turn around, I take my boots off while they're still outside the tent. You know, if I need to knock the snow or the dirt off of them, I can do that. That way I can keep them in the tent with me so they're not gonna freeze, but I'm not bringing a bunch of snow and moisture inside because if you have a, a watertight floor on your tent, that liquid's just gonna roll around and go to the lowest part of the tent. It's gonna soak into your sleeping bag. It's gonna soak into your clothes for the next day. It's just gonna be a, a, bad, a bad scene. Get into your sleeping bag, zip up, go to bed. In the cold weather, I try to eat some food before I go to bed so that I have calories to burn at night. I want some, I want some protein and I want some complex carbohydrates. I, I try to avoid the sugar, but protein and complex carbs, and you can burn that all night. I, I will usually not drink a whole lot for the, the, in, for the two or three hours before I go to bed. I try to stop my fluid intake so that I don't have to get up in the middle of the night, get outside the tent where it's cold, I'd rather stay in my warm sleeping bag throughout the night. If you choose to wear anything while you're sleeping in the sleeping bag, just make sure that it's clean and dry. So take off everything you were wearing during the day and change into, a lot of people like to change into the next day's set of base layers. You know, So put on the, the, the clean, dry, long underwear top and bottom that you were going to wear the next day anyway. That way when you get up, that stuff's already on you, it's already warm, you're half dressed already, but what the last thing you wanna do is to try to climb into that sleeping bag wearing the sweaty, moist base layers from that, that day. You know, all, all that work we put into building a warm sleep system is gonna go out the window if you climb into it wearing wet gear.